And welcome back to Sports Talk. Doug Miles and Don Henderson with you. We come to you uh, on a Monday night. We're going to talk some uh, baseball right now, but uh, kind of more vintage baseball and history of baseball. Uh, it's all in a great new book about uh, kind of the history of uh, spring training and uh, our particular area. It's a little bit north of us in Sarasota, St. Petersburg, the great Al Lang Field, which uh, hosted so many of uh, the great spring training games, of course, spring training teams like the, the Yankees, the Mets, uh, the New York Giants, original Giants, St. Louis Cardinals, and, of course, the original uh, Tampa Bay Devil Rays. And uh, we're joined today by a good friend of ours from uh, when we used to uh, be an affiliate of uh, the Rays back at a previous station, uh, Rick Vaughn, of course, the uh, former director of uh, communications for the Tampa Bay Rays, and uh, now the uh, executive director of uh, the uh, uh, Joe Madden. Of course, we know him as the manager of the Rays here, the Respect 90 Foundation. The name of the book is called 100 Years of Baseball on St. Petersburg Waterfront, How the Game Helped Shape a City. We're going to talk to Rick for a few minutes about the book, kind of reminisce a little bit about uh, baseball and the Rays. And uh, Rick joined us tonight by telephone. Uh, Rick, a real pleasure to have you back on with us. I know it's been a while since we chatted on our various incarnations of radio and TV, but uh, good to have you back with us. It's great to be with both of you. We go back a few years, and it's, uh, it's really great to reconnect. Well, I'll tell you, you're working with a great guy right now. He was great in Tampa, uh, great in Chicago, and it uh, looks like he's in the home stretch out there in L.A. It looks like they're going to make some changes out there at the end of the season. But uh, you're working for a terrific, terrific guy. Joe's just a great guy. Yeah, he's been, uh, you know, been such an influence in my life, really, since he came on board in 2006 with the Rays. And um, then in 2017, I went to work, uh, you know, with him on his foundation, and he's uh, he's a very special person in that he's a, a testament to the power of positive thinking. Uh, you know, I, I'll never forget when he first came in with the Rays, and he was talking about, you know, we had finished up to that point in 10 years. We'd finished last place nine out of 10 years, and he came in and he said, you know, we're going to make the trap a place. We're going to be, it's going to be the pit. Nobody's going to want to play here. <laughs> And we were all like, sure, Joe, sure, you know, and <laughs> it, and it happened. You know, he, may, he, he he saw it. He saw the vision of it. He knew how he wanted to get there, and he changed the culture, which I know is an overused word, but he was one of the first ones to actually do that. And um, and now everybody kind of looks to try to be able to capture that, that type of um, magic that he did for us. And I've been blessed to know him for, for you know, what, 16 years now. Yeah, I didn't get to know him, obviously great, but just having a chance to cover the team when, we again, we were an affiliate and then on a regular basis and kind of go down after the game and, uh, you know, hear his little press conference. And, and just, I think, uh, he's got to be considered one of the great people managers of all time. I, I, just from my uh, experience a little bit, seeing him act with not only the players, but uh, some of the media as well, just a great guy. Uh, I and mean, you just kind of illustrated that by, you know, your feelings for him. Yeah, you know what, he, he was um... – his big thing was when it turned, when it came to the players in the clubhouse, he, he wanted them to be themselves. He didn't want them to put on an act when he walked by. He wanted them, he felt like they were always going to be their better selves, their better players if they were themselves. And so he encouraged, you know, people being individuals and not, uh, you know, being concerned about what people would think about what they were doing. And it, it made a very comfortable atmosphere. You know, he was not afraid to do things, at the time that were kind of looked at, um, you know, by baseball people with, um, you know, some real questions, you know, we were, we were one of the first teams, Joe, after a year or two, like after a, if we had a, a day game after a night game, we would, we wouldn't take batting practice. And up to that point, that was blasphemous. You mm-hmm. always took batting practice. There was never, never a time when you didn't take batting practice. And then the other teams would be on the field and they would be like, aren't you guys hitting today? We're like, no. <laughs> and now, and, and that was looked at like, that's crazy. And now that's what, that happens all the time in, in big league baseball. And that was something that Joe started. We, we started doing um, these kind of almost like high school team celebrations in our clubhouse after every win. Uh, you know, we have, he got a, like a disco ball in there and the players would bring in some of their instruments and it sounded absolutely horrible, <laughs> but we had a great time and everybody was we would, you know, they would toast the player of the game, and they, and it was, it really was like watching a high school team after they won the state championship, and they, and that was another thing. Like people would be like, "What is going on in there? Don't you have another game tomorrow?" And 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 this was the, and now I look around the league and you see them doing it in the dugout, you know, with wearing the 
the jackets and the cowboy hats and everybody does it now in their clubhouse. They make a big deal out of every win. And that was something that Joe started. The theme dress trips was another thing. We used to have our tri- our trips where we'd go on the road and we'd pick a theme as to how we were going to dress on that trip. And everybody else looked at us like we were nuts. I'll never forget, we, we had a trip one time. We were in Toronto and we were leaving uh, Toronto and the Blue Jays were leaving too. They were going on a road trip. We were going back home and we were all, you know, we were, you have to go through the main airport there because of customs. So we're in line and, and it was our lightning. It was our trip, a salute to the lightning uh, trip. So everybody on the team was wearing like these lightning hoodies and all kinds of stuff that was, you know, pretty casual look. And here come the Blue Jays around the corner, uh, you know, as a group. And they're all in like these three piece suits <laughs> They look at us and guys are wearing hoodies and beanies and everything else. And I thought they're either saying, gosh, they are really weird over there. Or they're saying, I wish I could dress like that. And that was, that was the other thing. Joe didn't have a dress code much. You know, you, you, there were a couple things you couldn't do. You couldn't wear shorts. You, you had to wear shoes. You couldn't wear, you know, flip flops and stuff, but he had a very relaxed dress code and his, and his reasoning for it was exactly right. I mean, we were getting ready to get on a flight. You know, you play a game at night, you finish at 11, you get to the airport about 1230, you get on the flight, you land in, let's say, Boston at 230 in the morning, you get to the hotel at 330. You're not going to see one person that whole time. There's no one you're going to see. You're not, you know, you're, 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 you're flying and traveling when no one's around, no one's awake. And so he wanted the players to be comfortable. He said, why would, why would I make you wear a three-piece suit? when we're not going to act even, be, even be out in the public at all. I want you to be comfortable. I want you to sleep on the plane if you want to. Yeah. And so he did all of these kind of things that no one else did. And I think a lot of people have already forgotten that he was, uh, you know, he pioneered a lot of those things that are happening today, all with the same intent of trying to keep uh, players relaxed and happy and not worried about, oh, I got to wear this particular suit or I got to, you know, act this particular way. And, and um, he started, to, he really was a father of, of this kind of a revolution. Of course, the other thing he's most famous for, I think, is some of the antics of they were losing streak or they were not hitting or they were not, he, he, he'd bring crazy things into the clubhouse coming in and he wanted to change the whole complexion. Forget about how badly we're playing right now. Tomorrow we're going to turn, turn the page and go in another direction. That's right, Don. We had, uh, we, we had, uh, big, uh, big snakes in the clubhouse. We had penguins <laughs> in the clubhouse. We had uh, alligators. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, we would have a. And then we had a mariachi band, and and uh, one night we had them scheduled to play before the game, but they were late and they couldn't make it. And Joe was like, "Well, you know what? Have them come anyway, and they can play afterwards." Well, as it turns out, we lost the game. But here's a mariachi band in our clubhouse playing after we just lost the game. <laughs> And nobody really made a big deal out of it. It was just like the players, you know, the Latin guys were really liking it, and they're dancing around in there. And you know what? It, it, it really helped absorb a loss and to move on. And that's what, you know, he was all about. One more thing before we get to the book, Rick. Uh, I mean, in addition to the, you know, the great things he did as a manager, but I think even more importantly, and he probably said the same thing, uh, the, uh, the meals he would do for uh, the Thanksgiving, right? The, the Thanksgiving meals he did a lot down in our area. Yeah, yeah. You Saint know, Pete. that that started when he was a coach with the Angels, actually. And, you know, he'd be on a bike ride or he'd be out and he'd see people that their whole life was in a shopping cart. And he, he just vowed then that if I ever get a chance where I have a platform where I can, you know, make a difference, uh, we're going we're gonna to try to do our best to at least – uh, you know, help out with that and and to create awareness uh, for the situation. So yeah, we did that for all the years he was here. We had and you know, and plus we had a blast doing it because we you know Joe would come in and we would cook some of his family recipes uh, to to uh, take to the homeless shelters. And when we were we were in Sarasota a few times. We were in right. Bradenton. We went down to I think Fort Myers a couple times. So we would try to get all over Tampa Bay and just. More than anything, it was just to create awareness that, 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 you know, there are people out there, and a lot of times through no fault of their own, they need help. And that was, uh, yeah, that was Joe's community legacy was our Thanksmas uh, trip. Well, I know the history, of, uh, the history of St. Petersburg and, and baseball is a big part of your book. And, and uh, I go back, I guess maybe I go back a little bit further than you. Because <laughs> my, my first trip to St. Petersburg was with the Cleveland Indians in 1954. Huh. And uh, they trained in, in St. Petersburg, that minor league, not the major league franchise, yep. but the yep. minor league team. 
trained there, and I came down with them in 1954. And uh, so I've been through the Yankees, uh, St. Louis Cardinals, Mr. Bush, and of course, what he did and uh, what he did in St. Petersburg and in the in Tampa Bay area with the Cardinals. And but let's get to you because you've got the history down pat. I've only got the the uh, fringes of it. <laughs> well, it's it's. Um... I, I actually did not start out to write a book. I really, I was down at the Alang site uh, a couple of years ago, and I noticed that, you know, they play soccer there now, and I'm, I like soccer, um, but they've really turned it into a soccer venue to their credit. But there's really nothing, almost nothing there uh, that commemorates the fact that there were 193 future Hall of Famers either played or managed there. Mm. Uh, beginning in 1922 on that, basically on that site, that site held three really different ballparks. The first one was waterfront park and that was built in 1921. And then the major league Boston Braves came to be the first major league team to train on the waterfront there in 1922. And then in 1947, they knocked it down and just maybe a half a block. Uh, I guess it would be South of there. They built, uh, Alang field, and then 30 years after that, Alang Stadium uh, was built on that same location. So it was three different parks, but they were all on, uh, you know, shared footprints. Um, but I really wasn't, all I wanted to do was really bring it to the attention of the city that it really, we needed to do something to memorialize that. You know, A, there's people that like you, Don, that remember stuff that went on there. Wouldn't it be nice to trigger some of those memories? But also, as much growth as there's been in the Tampa Bay area, especially St. Petersburg, there's probably tons of people that don't even know baseball was played there because it's been Absolutely. since 2008. You know, that's the last, uh, the Rays last year there. So I was just trying to put this research together to take to them and just say, hey, will you guys consider doing something, you know, um, similar to what some other of the uh, cities have done. If you if you go up to Orlando, um, Tinker Field is gone, but they have put together a beautiful little plaza of the history of what went on in that ballpark. And it it's a tiny little thing. It's not that big, but it would take you 30 minutes to read and look at everything that they have there. And then you go to Clearwater and Jack Russell Stadium. And while that stadium is still standing, they have what they call their Monument Park. And they've done a great job uh, with a lot of the monuments that also mem memorialize what went on at Jack Russell. And neither one of those places have anywhere near the history that Al Lang Field has, uh, and primarily because for so many years there were two teams that trained there. You know, whether it was the uh, the Reds, uh, the uh, Boston Braves and the Yankees, then it was the Cardinals and the Yankees for many, many years, and then it was the Cardinals and the Mets for, uh, you know, a long time. Um, so anyway, I, I put this research together, and as I was doing it, you know, I keep telling my wife, I'd say, gosh, I didn't know about this, and I didn't know this happened, and I don't, and she finally said to me, why don't you write a book, and I really didn't think that I had the energy to do it, um, but then my friend Tim Kirkchen from ESPN, who wrote the foreword for the book, right. as it turned out, he really encouraged me, he said, you know what, this is something you'll be so glad that you did this, and and so all the famous Tim Kirchner. That's right. Yeah, actually, I, I went up there. My wife and I went up for his uh, his ceremony up there a couple of uh, weeks ago. We had a, a great time. So I had all this info. I wrote I ended up getting um, uh, Arcadia Publishing to publish the book. And I was really happy and proud. And I'm, I'm still hoping that the city uh, will do something to properly recognize what went on there. I mean, like I said, there were a, it's hard to believe that there were 193 future Hall of Famers played or managed there. There's a lot of history there. And uh, I'll tell you, the, the, thing, the biggest history was the peanut sales, man. What, what, what the peanut sales that he used, used yeah, to run? Uh, that I, was I, one I, of the most famous guys, <laughs> most famous uh, vendors, not anyone a vendor. He's a personal, I mean, a, what, what do you call him? I guess an independent employee. But he was yep. a character boy. Yeah, you know what, Mr. Walton, I mentioned him very prominently in the book because he was a, such a part of the of the scenery there, and he was such oh, an iconic absolutely. figure. Um, and even went even went on the Tonight Show uh, one time just to to sing and to talk about you know his exploits as a as a the singing vendor, and he became really popular. And it's amazing when you talk to players that played there when he was there; they remember him very well. You know, they remember him, his voice through the throughout the ballpark. So there were th so many things like that that happened there that I really, um, you know, I hope people find it interesting. You know, um, 
I think they will. I, I, uh, I did put a lot of research into it and, and I, I was not able to find, you know, I read a lot of history books on St. Pete, uh, but I wasn't really able to find a book that was just about, uh, you know, baseball being played on our waterfront down there. So I was pleased to be able to put a lot of this together in one place. And, um, you know, it's, listen, there wasn't just baseball that helped that develop that city, but it certainly had a lot to do with it. If, you know, you're going back before 1920s, I think the city pretty much recognized that tourism, you know, like a lot of, uh, Florida was cities was going to be a major part of, of what their future was going to be, but they really hadn't figured out how to activate it. And Al Lang, who was the two time mayor in St. Pete, he was smart enough to realize he loved he loved the city and he loved baseball and he put the two of them together and he really kind of put uh, the tourism business on the back of baseball. You know, he didn't just bring in the Boston Braves. He got uh, the New York Yankees there. So he had two of the top three media markets in the country coming down there for the first 12, 13 years, you know, for, for uh, the first quarter of the year. And there were the, all of these bylines coming from St. Pete and, it really helped uh, promote tourism, and he did a great job of cleaning up the city, making it friendly, making it uh, aesthetically pleasing. But he really used baseball to carry the water for the tourism, I think, uh, and was able to g- generate a lot of publicity through baseball. Once he got the media down there, it wasn't he was he was delighted that they were covering baseball, but he was also happy to show them the rest of the city and how how much it had grown out of this little sleepy village into this tourism. Uh, you know, destination. And it, it got to the point where some of the larger newspapers were not even, when they wrote their dateline from St. Pete, they didn't even bother putting Florida because everybody knew where St. Petersburg was. And I, uh, and I, and then it got to a point where every team that was interested in coming to Florida, because at that point they were pretty scattered throughout the South, Southeast and even Southwest, you know, you had teams training, you know, in Texas and, and uh, Louisiana and, other, uh, you know, southern states, uh, and they started, pay, people started paying attention to what was going in Florida, and Al Lang was like a, a conduit for that. If, if teams were interested in coming to not just St. Petersburg, but to Florida, that, you know, their first call was to Al Lang to give them, uh, you know, to get advice on how to make it happen. So we, St. Pete became an incredibly important city uh, for baseball for many years, you know, the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, all the way through you know the late 80s when the Mets were still training there, you had New York media covering baseball there for uh, you know seven decades. Um, so I was just amazed to realize how important uh, all of that was. They back in the day they when they had the two league presidents, the American League and the National League uh, presidents, uh, the commissioner would let them pick where they would want to spend their winter for you know their sort of unofficial winter headquarters every year. And one of the commissioners back in the late 20s, a fellow by the name of Ernest Barnhard, he chose St. Pete. So for two or three years, you know, once the season was over and before spring training ended, American League, all official American League business was conducted right in St. Pete. Mm. Um, And so there was just, you know, and and, and then you go back to Lang again, and it wasn't just bringing those teams here, but it was keeping them, uh, keeping them in St. Pete. I read a lot about how many times the Yankees were, wooed by other markets it happened all the time everybody wanted the yankees in their town because of what it meant to for you know yeah, they started they started when i was growing up they started in fort lauderdale yeah that's right so it was um it was a big deal you know to not just get the teams there but to keep them there all that time and to have the yankees and the cardinals which even to this day are still the two most successful franchises in the major leagues in terms of winning you know most world series won one uh, those guys were, were basically shared the facilities for three or four decades, and and St. Pete benefited greatly for it. And it was just uh, e- even during the Great Depression, um, having New York and Boston train uh, in St. Pete during the Great Depression, I found a few historians that told me that it was their thoughts that because they had these large, large media markets uh, training here and bringing the media here and people from markets that could afford to come down here. It really helped get the city out of the depression, maybe a little bit earlier than it would have otherwise. So it had, and, and the civil rights issues in the early sixties that I think 
uh, I got the feeling, and I got to talk to Bill White. Uh, I, got, I know you guys remember Bill White. He was a, a really good uh, first baseman with the Cardinals, and then he was the first black play-by-play announcer for uh, baseball on the radio, and then he became the league president, and he's still alive. And I, I got to talk to him about what it was like, and you know, there was this notion that after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier that things had gotten a lot better in terms of civil rights and baseball but in Florida, that was not the case. You know, there were still laws here uh, that were, uh, there were still some really uh, Jim Crow-like laws here where the players could not, um, the, the black players, uh, Hispanic players could not stay in the hotels with the white players. And that was going on into the 60s. And that all started a change. And a lot of it had to do with what went on in St. Pete. And the Cardinals players and people like Bill White and others sort of stood up to this. And the hotels uh, finally caved and um, kind of went against the law, really, against the state law and allowed uh, the players to all stay under one roof. And, in fact, right. Sarasota, another key player in that was when Bill Veck, uh, you know, owned the White Sox and they were training in Sarasota. And he was another one that stood up and said, our players are all going to stay in one hotel. And he was a leader in that, too. And that was going on in Sarasota at the same time in the early 60s. But but St. Pete played a, a pretty big role in a lot of different things. Or baseball played a, a, a pretty big role in a lot of cultural things that happened in the city. And, um, you know, I just, again, I had no idea of some of the things that, uh, just how powerful St. Petersburg was as a baseball, really a media center every year, a very large media center every year for six or seven decades. Just a quick caveat to what you're saying with Bill. I had, one, had lunch with Bill just before we came. He doesn't live too far from me back home. And uh, so I see him every now and then. We have him on the show every once in a while. Mm-hmm. I don't like to do too many shows, but he does. He, he will if you, if, you, if you ask him. And uh, But uh, uh, his wife is, uh, has a little Alzheimer's right now, so he slows mm-hmm. down with that plus age. But uh, you, you're exactly correct, but he was also a part of the Cardinals when Mr. Bush came down and uh, took over the franchise. Yeah. And he said that uh, he bought the hotel and that all, all our players will stay in the same hotel. That's right. I own That's the what hotel. They did. <laughs> you're right. They, they did. They bought, they bought the hotel. That's what they had to do. <laughs> and then exactly eventually, yeah, eventually, I think the, the state itself, not just St. Pete, but the state itself realized that they were going to start losing these teams if they didn't change their way. And, and there, was a, there were a few reasons that the Yankees left when they did after 1961 season. One, one they, they, I think they got tired of sharing a stadium with another team. But, I, but one of the reasons that also was included in their announcement when they left St. Pete was that they wanted to be able to stay in a hotel with all their players, and they weren't able to do that when they left in, after the 61 season. Mm. Um, so it had, a, it, had a, it had a bearing on it. And then you had – uh, and Bill White told me this. He goes, the other thing was, and I didn't realize this, that Arizona was happy to steal any teams they could out of Florida, and they didn't have the <laughs> situation. You know, they didn't have that right. uh, race situation out there. And so it really kind of was a slap in the face to the baseball owners and the hotels and the, even the government um, in in Florida that they better wise up or they were going to lose a lot of business and, and uh, financial windfall. Well, Mr. Train. Wrigley, he recognized it immediately out in Phoenix when he set that town up. And then, of course, uh, even right up until a few years ago when uh, we lost uh, the franchise in Sarasota, when after Goodyear, Arizona split with Cleveland. Uh, they're still trying to poach teams out there, no question about that. Yeah. Yeah, well, my, my hope is that this book will, um, you know, ignite some memories from people that grew up in the St. Pete area and went to games there regularly. And if you've been through St. Pete lately, you can't go a block without seeing cranes. There's so much construction oh, sure. going right. on downtown. And, and so my my other hope is that people that don't even have a clue that baseball was played there, I think would be amazed at how much history they live very close to. 
Let me give Doug. the title. Let me give the title one more time. And it's a great book. I had a chance to read through it, and uh, just the baseball history uh, going back, like you talked about, back to the Babe Ruth days, and uh, the history of Al Lang yeah. himself. Uh, one hundred years of baseball on St. Petersburg waterfront. How the game helped shape a city. And uh, we've been talking with uh, our friend Rick Vaughn. And Rick, I know we could do a couple hours, but uh, we kept you longer than we said. So we'll maybe we'll do a part two uh, down the road a piece. But where can people get the book? Any, I'll talk to you guys anytime. Great memories, uh, you know, hearing your voice. Again, a book available everywhere, Rick. Uh, we had a lot of fun and uh, a lot of great days. But uh, not only that, with <laughs> when you were at basketball, and uh, of course, I did the Seventy Sixers for a lot of years. And uh, so, we, when you were at basketball, and then down here with the <clears throat> the Rays, why we've had a lot of fun. Yes, we have. No doubt, we have great talking to you guys. Rick, Rick, before you go, where can they get the book? Just all the places, Amazon. Yeah, the places? easiest thing is you can get it. It's available on Amazon. Okay. Um, it should be in Barnes and Nobles in Sarasota. Um, it should be at Walmart, but you can. But it's if you just want to get it online, you can go to Barnes and Nobles or Amazon. is probably the easiest way to uh, to get it. Great. We'll also put a link on our site as well. But Rick, uh, great talking with you, and we'll uh, do it again soon. Thanks for being with us tonight. You bet. You guys have a great evening. I'm Stan Brock. Thirty years ago, I formed Remote Area Medical to help people overseas. But then we found generations of families in America isolated by poverty from the health care they need. Together, we can take dental, vision, and medical help to a million adults and their kids right here at home in the United States of America.